sleep in the middle of the afternoon. Yeah, but you know, I find as far as age, uh, we can be old as far as years and still be young as far as even because I know sometimes like we're pushing 80, Ed. Okay. And of course, Violet's passed us up. But a lot of people, 40, actually are older than what we are. And I have a friend that is 101. Mm. She still has a sharp mind and she was doing fine. Uh, she did fall here a few months ago and break her pelvis, but she's still doing fine at 101. And mm -hmm. one moment oh. used to come to the fair all the time. She died just the few weeks before she was 112 and her mind was still wow. sharp. Well, there's hope for me then. I must be middle-aged. I'm 65, so I got a long <laughs> way to go. Yep, you do. <laughs> Okay, Lynn, are you there? I am. Yeah, yeah, there you are. Okay. We are ready. Okay. Um, Hopefully it works for you good this time. Yeah, for sure. Maybe the third time's a charm. <laughs> okay. It is. Okay, well, we will start with prayer. Most kind, gracious Father in heaven, we thank you again for another day of life. We thank you for health and we thank you for strength. We thank you for bringing us all here again today on this day of uh, tabernacles, a joyous time. And we just pray that your sweet spirit will be with us during this time and give us clarity of mind and help us to see and understand the message you have for each one of us today. And just guide us in our life and prepare us for your soon coming and bless everyone that is watching and uh, those that might be in the future as well. And thank you all so much for the speakers that we have heard and the messages you have given us. It's all so inspiring. And we thank you in the precious name of our wonderful Savior, Yeshua HaMashiach. We ask these things. Amen. Amen. Okay, we're going to be speaking now of the last three um, trumpets of Revelation. Okay. We think we will. <laughs> okay, Revelation 8, 13. And behold, and I beheld and heard an angel fly, flying through the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth by reason of the other voices of the trumpet of the three angels which are yet to sound. And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit, and there rose a smoke out of the pit, as a smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth. And unto them was given power, as the scorpions of the earth have power. Joel also gives a very descriptive narrative about this same event. In Joel 2, 2, he says, A day of darkness and of gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness, as the morning spread upon the mountains, a great people and a strong. And there hath not been ever the like, neither shall be any more after it. And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree. But only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. And to them it was given that they should not kill them, but that they should be tormented five months. And in those days shall men seek death and shall not find it and shall desire to die, and death shall flee from them. And their torment was as the torment of a scorpion when he striketh a man. And the shapes of the horses were like horses prepared into battle. And on their heads were as it were crowns of gold, and their faces were as the faces of men. And they had hair as the hair of women, and their teeth were as the teeth of lions. <clears throat> And they had breastplates as if were as it were breastplates of iron, 
and the sound of their wings was as the sound of chariots of many horses running to battle. And they had tails likened to scorpions, and there were stings in their tails, and their power was to hurt men five months. And they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in his, the Greek tongue hath his name Apollyon. So what is this very weird description of the fifth trumpet all about? Do we take it to be literal or symbolic? Is it, it is a very literal event indeed, but John is trying to describe something that is unseen to humans, something that can only be expressed in symbolic language. As we have already identified the star that was seen falling to earth in both the third and the fifth trumpet is Satan on a mission of destruction. And I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. What and where is the bottomless pit? Let's first find the definition of bottomless pit. Bottomless means abuso or depth, depthless, less, abyss or deep. And the pit is a hole in the ground dug for obtaining or holding water or for other purposes. Figuratively, an abyss as a prison. So we see the word bottomless pit and the abyss have the same meaning, a depthless hole in the ground used to contain or hold something or someone as in a prison. For if God spared not the angels that sinned but cast them down to hell, abyss, and delivered or committed them into chains of darkness, gloom, to be reserved, detained unto judgment. In Revelation 21 through 3, we read that at the second coming of Christ, a mighty angel who has the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand, takes a hold of Satan and casts him into the abyss, binding him in this bottomless pit for a thousand years. In the story given us in Luke 8, it also gives us a clue about what and where the bottomless pit or the abyss is. When Yeshua commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man who was possessed with a regiment of devils, the demons begged him repeatedly not to order them to go into the abyss. This evidence, together with the fact that Satan will be cast into the abyss after the second coming of Christ, seems to indicate that the bottomless pit is a very unpleasant abode of Satan and his demons. The abyss represents some place of isolation away from heaven and men, apparently a place of misery. Many years ago, I heard that there had been sightings of UFOs disappearing into the earth at the North Pole. This could easily make sense as being the bottomless pit, a place of isolation away from heaven and men. Could I add that this is also the abode of Santa Claus? And here we have a picture of Santa Claus's house, and it's in the North Pole, Alaska. The center of the earth seems to be a perfect place for the bottomless pit. We must ever bear in mind that Jehovah is at all times in control of everything that happens here on earth, as well as over all his creation. This includes Satan and all his demonic hosts. When Satan is given the key to the bottomless pit, it means that Yah has lifted the restraint which has been placed on the devil and his evil host. Now he has given permission to allow his demons to come out of their prison house for a season to fulfill the purpose of Jehovah in the closing scenes of earth's history. And he opened the bottomless pit. And there rose out of the smoke locusts upon the earth. What? were they given power to do? And they had tails likened to scorpions, and there were stings in their tails, and their power was to hurt men for five months. This also takes us back to the plagues in Egypt. In Exodus 20, excuse me, 10, verse 4, 5, and 6, it says, Tomorrow will I bring the locusts into the coast. They shall cover the face of the earth, that one cannot be able to see the earth. And they shall fill thy houses and the houses of all thy servants and the houses of all thy Egyptians 
which neither thy father nor thy father's father have seen since the day that they were upon the earth and to this day. But you notice here the locusts, they filled, they covered the earth and it was dark. And, but the locusts that are going to come out in the trumpet is going to totally blacken the sky. So comparing this with Joel's prophecy, and they run to and fro in the city. They shall run up on the wall. They shall climb up upon the houses. They shall enter in at the windows like a thief. Notice these locusts were only to enter the houses of the Egyptians and their servants, not the dwellings of the Israelites. And they shall fill thy houses and the houses of all thy servants and the houses of all the Egyptians. The same for the locusts in Revelation. They could only harm those without the seal of Yah. And unto them was given power as the scorpions of the earth have power. In Luke 10, Jesus had sent 72 of his disciples out two by two on a missionary tour. And they returned with a thrilling report. Lord, they said, even the demons submit to us in your name. Jesus gave the disciples two reasons why the demons were subject to them. First, he said, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. In other words, Satan is a fallen foe. Notice the similarity of this statement to what John describes in the fifth trumpet. I saw a star fall from heaven and to the earth. When Jesus said that he had seen Satan fall from heaven like lightning, he was explaining while the disciples could cast out demons. Satan and his demons had no power over the disciples, but, and this is Jesus' second reason, the disciples did have power over the demons. Behold, I give unto you power to tread upon serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. This is a powerful promise that we all need to remember and memorize if possible. The ser serpent has been a, de a demonic symbol since the beginning of time. In this verse, Jesus also makes scorpions a demonic symbol. This is additional evidence that the locusts in the fifth trumpet whose home is in the abyss, are demons. We have in the Old Testament book of Joel a type of this fifth trumpet in Revelation. Notice the following similarities between Joel and Revelation. Joel, a day of clouds and darkness. They have the appearance of horses. It has the teeth of a lion. With a noise like that of chariots, they leap over the mountaintops like a mighty army drawn up for battle. And in Revelation, the sun and sky were darkened by the smoke from the abyss. The locusts looked like horses prepared for battle. Their teeth were teeth, were like lion's teeth. The sound of their wings was like the thundering of many horses and chariots rushing into battle. Notice the activity of these locusts or demons in Revelation 9, 4 through 6. And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass, uh, the, I think that's trees, or the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree. The destroyers are all about, are not allowed to harm the vegetation of earth because it, if they did, the world would perish from famine before Christ arrived. They were given permission to hurt only those men which have not the seal of God in their forehead. The demons are only allowed to harm those who didn't have the seal of God. If we do not want to be tormented by these demons, then we must have the seal of Yah. What is his seal? And that will protect us. Wherefore, the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath for a perpetual covenant. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. And how am I Sabbath, that they shall be a sign between you, for me and you, that ye may know that I am the Lord your God? Why would Jesus allow the devil to harm his own people? The primary, 
Let's see, I think that should, why would Jesus allow the devil, excuse me, to harm his own people? The primary purpose of the seven trumpets is to awaken man to his need of salvation. Jesus will save all who turn to him in faith. The suffering inflicted by the devil will cause many to reconsider their need of a savior and many will be saved. Satan will not be allowed to afflict God's people during the fifth trumpet, but the torment that he and his evil hosts inflict on the wicked will be so terrible that they will long to die, but death will elude them. Job understood this kind of pain. In Job 3, 20 and 21, it says, Wherefore is light given to him that is in misery, and life unto the bitter in soul, which long for death, but it cometh not, and dig for it more than for hid treasures. That's a very sad state that these folks are going to be in. And I think that's the reason God really wants us to help them understand about the Sabbath um, before this time comes. Mm -hmm. These evil spirits were commanded not to kill them, but only to tor torture them for five months. And the agony they suffered was like that of a sting of a scorpion when he strikes a man. And we're going to later um, cover the five months in, the, in a later presentation. Whoops. And in those days shall men seek death and shall not find it and shall desire to die and, the flet, and death shall flee from them. For possibly more insight concerning the fifth, this fifth trumpet and the release of these demons, we need to take a look at the mysterious seven-story high, massive, high-powered International Observatory in southeastern Arizona, located six miles south of Safford. It's, it houses one of the largest telescopes on Earth. The Vatican Advanced Technology, uh, Technology Telescope. The Vatican Observatory Research Group operates the 1.8, and I think, I don't know what that M stands for, but it's an Alice P. Lemon telescope with its Thomas B. Bannon uh, as, astrophysics facility known together as a Vatican Advanced teles, uh, Technology Telescope at the Mount Graham in, International Observatory in southeastern Arizona. With the largest Light gathering power of the LBT astronomers are now able to collect the spectral fingerprint of the faintest and most distant object in the universe. Near infrared observations are essential for understanding the formation of stars and planets in our galaxy, as well as revealing the secrets of the most distant and young galaxies. What did they name this telescope? Lucifer which as you can see on the bottom here, what the, that all stands for, stands for. This telescope is dubbed Lucifer One and provides a powerful tool to gain spectacular insights into the universe from the Milky Way to extremely distant galaxies. Who else is involved with the Vatican in this observatory? Lucifer, is curiously described on the Vatican Observatory website as NASA and the Vatican's infrared telescope called Lucifer. Lucifer, the Vatican's mysterious, uh, 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 let me move that, astronomical observatory in Arizona, USA. How did the Vatican obtain this property? In 1984, the University of Arizona and the Vatican um, selected Mount Graham as a site for a complex of 18 telescopes. The fact that this is a sacred place for the Apache was not taken into consideration. To get around the legal barriers um, the, of the American Indian Religious Freedom Act, the university hired a lobbying firm to put pressure on Congress to remove this and other roadblocks. Congress passed the Arizona-Idaho Conservation Act in 1988 in response to lobbying by the University of Arizona and the Vatican. The act include a provision to allow the construction of a three telescope uh, on Mount Graham, 
without having to comply with the American Indian Religious Freedom Acts or with environmental laws. For many Native American uh, nations, there were certain geographic places which have special spiritual meaning. These sacred places are often portals to the spirit worlds. For the Apache in Arizona, one of these sacred places is Mount Graham. This is called the Dezel, I'm not sure if I can pronounce that, but it means a uh, big seated mountain. It is here that the Guinan, the guardian spirit of the Apache lives. Why has the Vatican take such an interest in outer space? What is it that the Vatican is looking for? What could eventually add mystery uh, to the Vatican's astronomical um, observatories would be the mysterious object they are apparently looking for, which would come from a very remote distance. According to researchers at the YouTube channel, Right Hemispheric Remote Viewing. If it reached Earth, the cosmic object would cause three days of darkness, create an environment characterized by fire and sulfur, and would be a source of great fear for those who are aware of the search, according to the presenter, John Vivanco. According to Mitch Batrum, some people believe it is for the purpose to monitor a warning presented in the Bible. What exactly is that warning they're looking for? Could it be it is named Wormwood, coming from the New Testament book of Revelation? Could this cosmic object in which they are intently watching for be that of the fallen star Wormwood or the falling star of Abaddon Apollyon? Let's take a look for some clues in the type of these trumpets given during the plagues of Egypt, just before the Exodus. We have the type given in the ninth plague of, plague of Egypt, which would be equivalent to the fifth trumpet at the end of time. And the Lord said unto Moses, stretch out thy hand towards heaven, that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt, even darkness which may be felt. And Moses stretched forth his hands uh, toward heaven. And there was a thick darkness in all the land of Egypt three days. They, the Egyptians, saw not one another, neither rose any from his place for three days. But all the children of Israel had light in their dwelling. The eighth plague in Egypt was that of the locusts, which came just before the ninth plague, which was the three days of darkness. I see that the fifth trumpet is a combination of both. When the bottomless pit is open, the locusts or demons coming out of the pit is what causes the darkening of the sun and sky. When this pit is opened, all the legions of demons from hell are released and come out in such droves that the sun and sky are darkened. I believe this coming out could last for three days, as Revelation 12, 4 says. A third of the angels of heaven sided with Lucifer in his rebellion against Yah and were cast out with him to this earth. Daniel 7, 10 speaks of the myriads of angels who minister to Yah. Thousands, thousands ministered unto him and ten thousands times ten thousands stood before him. A third of this number would be over an overwhelming amount of evil spirits. And there arose a smoke out of the pit as the smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. On the website called Catholic Answers, a question was asked. What is the Catholic position on the three days of darkness? The answer was given. The three days of darkness is a private revelation of several Catholic saints and mystics. It is said to be three days where there will be no light and hell will be loosed upon the world. Is it possible the Vatican has the same information as the Mayans? Both speak of an event coming from the center of our galaxy Milky Way. Both indicate a powerful celestial event. But the most important question of all is when. So people are looking. 
there's many people out there that see that something's about to happen that's not going to be very good. Continuing with the Vatican's observatory. The Vatican observatory is one of the oldest. I think I'll move this. Active uh, astronomical observatories in the world with its roots going back to 1582 and the reform of the Julian calendar. One of the important duties of the church is to maintain an accurate calendar, and this requires astronomical observations, hence the involvement of the Vatican with astronomy. Whoops. Whoops. <laughs> The first Vatican Observatory was established in 1774. Papal interest in astronomy can be traced to Pope Gregory XIII, who had the Towers of the Winds built in the Vatican in 1578. The observatory in its present form was officially founded in 1891 by Pope Leo XIII. Today, there are 13 Jesuits from six countries throughout the world on staff of this observatory the Superstition Mountains, and the Lucifer Device. Who oversees this operation for the Vatican? That this institution is run by priests of the Society of Jesus, known as Jesuits, may not sound so strange because they are traditionally in charge of the most intriguing missions of the Catholic Church, and their direct access to the popes give them certain privileges. The authors visited this observatory to learn more about the facility the Lucifer device, and generally what the Vatican's interest is in outer space. They asked the Jesuit on duty that day, who told us that among the most important research in, uh, occurring with the site, Vatican astronomers, astronomers is the quest to pinpoint certain um, extrasolar planets and advanced alien intelligence. Indeed, though, uh, oneness with which the Jesuit discussed the UFOs stunned us as we sat in the control room listening to him speak so casually of the redundancy with which UFOs are captured on screen darting through the heavens. We were shocked at this, how ordinary it seemed to be. Consolo Mango shared with them a private article um, in PDF, which, in which he admits how contemporary societies will soon look to the aliens to be the saviors of mankind. Observatory director Jose Fumes has gone equally far, suggesting that alien life not only exists in the universe and is our brother, but will, when manifested, confirm the true faith of Christianity and the dominion of Rome. As the authors dug deeper, questioned more, and followed up, they were told how some Vatican the theologians accept the possibility that an extraterrestrial species may exist that is morally superior to men or closer to God than we fallen humans are, and that consequently they may come here to evangelize us. Wonderful. Giuseppe uh, states this would not immediately oblige the Christians to renounce his own faith in God, simply on the base of the reception of new unexpected information of a religious character from extraterrestrial citizens, uh, civilization, but that such a renunciation could come soon after as a new religious content originating from outside the earth is confirmed as reasonable and credi credible and may require conducing a, um, a re-reading of the gospel inclusive to the new data. That's amazing information. And according to the former Vatican Observatory uh, Vice Director, Christopher Corbley, while Christ is the first and the last word, the Alpha and the Omega spoken to humanity, he is not necessarily the only word spoken to the universe, which brings us to the reason for the Lucifer device. Lucifer is an infrared telescope. Why should someone want that? Some UFOs cannot be seen with the naked eye, only infrared. We 
only ever see camera phones videos on TV and YouTubes. They are shaky, unfocused, and rarely uh, definite. However, some of the most astonishing UFOs ever caught on film have been reported in, with infrared. So the Vatican is interested in UFOs and aliens. It is prepared to accept a different enlightened gospel from what they had been entrusted with. Further, they are willing to compel the faithful to renounce their faith in favor of an alien story, its enlightened version of God and the Bible. The Pope is recognizing change and he's recognizing science, needs to make religion and Catholicism relevant. This is about the growing secularization of societies. It's about survival. The Vatican and Catholic Church are neck high in idolatry and apostasy. So it is any wonder. So is it any wonder that they are looking for aliens? And in Luke 21, 11, he says, and there will be fearful sights and great signs shall there be from heaven. After the overwhelming shock of the first four trumpets, the whole world will stand in horror at the terrible devastation that has come on the earth. Human beings recognizing that their survival as a race is threatened will be grasping for solutions for some way, any way, out of the des desperate situation that they are in. Furthermore, I expect that Earth's inhabitants will immediately recognize the calamities that devastated their pl planet to be an act of God, and they will turn to their religious leaders for a spiritual solution. But what solution can the religious leaders offer? Enter Satan, E.T. He and his angels will claim to be from another part of our galaxy, or perhaps from a distant galaxy in the universe, claiming to be an advanced race that has overcome similar problems. They will offer their help. Their help will be spiritual as well as physical. And of course, the whole world will be searching for spiritual answers. The last four verses of the fifth trumpet in John is John doing his best to give the description of these evil spirits on their mission to torment mankind. How does one describe a demon spirit? And the shapes of the locusts were likened to horses prepared into battle, and on their heads were as it were a crown of gold, and their faces were as the faces of men. And they had hair as the hair of women, and their teeth were as the teeth of lions. And they had breastplates as it were breast, breastplates of iron, and the sounds of their wings was as the sound of chariots of many horses running to battle. And they had tails like unto scorpions, and there were stings in their tails, and their power was to hurt men five months. And they had a king over them, which is the king of the bottomless pit. Satan sees that his time is short. He has set all his agencies at work that men may be deceived, deluded, occupied, and entranced until the day of probation shall be ended and the door of mercy forever shut. One woe is past, and behold, there come two more woes hereafter. And the sixth angel sounded. And I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God, saying to the sixth angel, which had the trumpet, loose the four angels, which are um, bound in the great rivers Euphrates. And the four angels were loosed, which were prepared for an hour and a day and a month and a year for to slay the third part of men. And the number of the army of the horsemen were 200,000 thousand. And I heard the number of them. And thus I saw the horses in vision, and then that sat upon them, having breastplates of fire and jasoneth, and brimstone, and the heads of the horses were as the heads of lion, and out of their mouth issued fire and smoke and brimstone. By these three were the third part of men killed, by the fire and by the smoke and by the brimstone, which issued out of their mouths, for their power is in their mouth and in their tails. For their tails were likened to serpents and had heads, and with them they do hurt. And the rest of the men, which were not killed by these plagues, yet repented not of their works, but their hands, that they should not worship devils, 
and idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and of wood, which neither can see nor hear nor walk. Neither repented they of their murders, nor of their sorcerers, nor of their fornications, nor of their thefts. The sixth trumpet is closely related to the fifth. It is also more terrible than any of the previous trumpets. It can take place only after the five month period of the fifth trumpet is over. At the time the demons were first released from the abyss, they were still somewhat restrained. God told Satan that he could torment Job by destroying his property and afflicting his body, but he put uh, a restraint, put on a restraint. Satan could not kill Job. The demons in the fifth trumpet can only torment earth's inhabitants. They are held back from killing them. They can only torment the wicked. They are specifically commanded not to torment God's people. But in the sixth trumpet, all restraint is removed, and they are permitted to kill a third of mankind. For a clear understanding of these two different trumpet events, and to identify the players involved, we need to compare the description, the location, and action of each group. In the fifth trumpet, a star falls from heaven into earth and opens up the bottomless pit. Satan is given permission to release the demons from the pit, a place of isolation from heaven and men. The sixth angel was given the commission to loose or release the four angels who were bound or confined or restrained in the great rivers Euphrates, a literal place in the Middle East. The fifth trumpet, and there arose a smoke out of the pit as the smoke of a great furnace and the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the pit. The amount of demons coming out of this pit were so excessive, so enormous as to darken the sun, they could not be numbered. But in the sixth trumpet, the angel gave to John the number of the army, 200,000, which is 200 million horsemen army. That's a lot. This earthly army is incredibly massive, 200 million. This can only be a global army. In the fifth trumpet, John's description of the demon or the locust describes somewhat in military terms. But in the sixth trumpet, it portrays an enormous army prepared for a great war. And the shapes of the locusts were likened to horses prepared into battle and on their heads were as it were crowns of gold and their faces were as the face of demons. That's the, that's the fifth trumpet, but the sixth he says, and thus I saw the horses in vision and them that sat on them. He didn't have to try to describe what it looked like. And they had breastplates as it were breastplates of iron. And this is the fifth trumpet. And the sound of their wings were as the sound of chariots of many horses running to battle. And the sixth trumpet says having breastplates of fire and of jason and, and brimstone. And the fifth trumpet, and they had hair, the hair of a woman and their teeth were the teeth of lions. And in the sixth trumpet, and the heads of the horses were as the heads of lions, and out of their mouth issued fire and smoke and brimstone. Yeah. In the fifth trumpet, and they had tails like unto scorpions, and there were steams in their tails, and their power was to hurt men five months. In the sixth trumpet, for their power is in their mouth and in their tails, and their tails were like unto serpents, and with them they do hurt. In the fifth trumpet, the demons were restricted for a limited time, five months, to only torment but not kill any man. But in the sixth trumpet, when the precise moment in time comes, the hour, the day, the month, and the year, this restriction is lifted by the highest authority in heaven. Angels are now restraining the winds of strife that they may not blow until the world shall be warned of its coming doom. But a storm is gathering, ready to burst upon the earth. And when God shall bid his angels loose the winds, there will be such a scene of strife as no man can picture. Loose the four angels which are bound in the great rivers Euphrates. And the four angels were loosed, which were prepared for an hour and a day and a month and a year to go forth to slay a third part of men. By these three was the third part of men killed by the fire, by the smoke, and by the brimstone, which issued out of their mouth. 
The nations of the world are eager for conflict, but they are held in check by the angels. When this restraining power is removed, there will come a time of trouble and anguish. But they are to be held, kept under control till the time shall come for the great battle of Armageddon. Every form of evil is to spring into intense activity. Evil angels unite their powers with evil men. And as they have been in constant conflict and attain to an experience in the best modes of deception and battle and have been strengthening for centuries, they will not yield the last great final contest, contest um, without a desperate struggle. This is going to be an absolutely incredible to see if we live through it. And the rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues yet repented not of their works of their hands, that they should not worship devils and idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and of wood, which neither can see nor hear nor walk. Neither repented they of their murders, nor of their sorcerers, nor of their fornications, nor of their thefts. We're talking very literal war here. And thou shalt come from thy place out of the north par parts, thou and many pe people with thee, a great company and a mighty army. Thou shalt come up against my people of Israel as a cloud to cover the land. It shall be in the latter days, and I will bring thee against my land, and the heathen may that the heathen may know me. And in Joel it says, For a nation has come up upon my land, strong and without number, whose teeth are the teeth of a lion, and he hath the cheek of uh, chief teeth of a uh, teeth of a lion. Alas for that day, for the day of the Lord is at hand, and as a destruction from the Almighty shall it come. The second woe was past, and behold, the third woe cometh quickly. And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven, saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And the four and the twenty elders which sat before God on their seats fell upon their faces and worshipped God, saying, We give thee thanks, O Lord God Almighty which art and was and art to come, because thou hast taken to thee, thee thy great power and has reigned. And the nations were angry, and thy wrath is come, and the time of the dead that they should be judged, and shouldest destroy them which destroy the earth. And that thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants, the prophets, and to the saints, and them that fear thy name, small and great. And the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament. And there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and an earthquake and great hail. What event takes place when the seventh trumpet sounds? But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished, as he hath declared to his servants, the prophets. This is the day we're all looking for. Now, what is this mystery of God? Now unto him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began. And for me, that utterance may be given unto me that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. These texts tells us that the proclamation of the gospel has a termination point, the end of the age, just before the second coming of Christ. Logic requires us to understand that the gospel will be preached only during probationary time. Once probationary, probation closes, there will be no more need for the gospel because every human being will have made his or her final choice. The close of probation. The work of man's redemption will soon be ended. The last prayer for sinners will have been offered. The last tear shed the last warning given. 
our probation is soon to close. Soon will the voice from the throne declare, it is done. Hear that he that is unjust, let him be unjust still. He that is filthy, let him be filthy still. He that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according to his work shall be. Now we're going to get into the wrath of God, which is obviously going to be the seven last plagues. So this is why at the beginning of these talks, um, there's that question, are the seven trumpets before the plagues or do they fall along with the plagues after probation closes? And so I think that we've made it pretty clear that it will be before the close of probation that the seven trumpets um, are given. And then after the trumpets comes the plagues, the seven last plagues. The world is soon to be left by the angel of mercy and the seven last plagues are to be poured out. The bolts of God's wrath are soon to fall. And when he shall begin to punish the transgressors, there will be no period of respite until the end. After that, I looked and behold, the tem temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was opened. And the seven angels came out of the temple, having seven plagues clothed in pure white linen and having their breasts girded with golden girdles. And one of the four beasts gave unto the seven angels seven golden vials full of the wrath of God who liveth forever and ever. And the temple was filled with the smoke from the glory of God and from his power, and no man was able to enter into the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled. And I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, Go your ways and pour out the vials of the wrath of God upon the earth. And the first went and poured out his vial upon the earth, and there fell a noisome and grievous sore upon the men which had the mark of the beast, and upon them which worshipped his image. And the second angel poured out his vial upon the sea, and it became as the blood of a dead man, and every living soul died in the sea. And the third angel poured out his vial upon the rivers and fountains of water, and they became blood. And I heard the angel of the water say, Thou art righteous, O Lord, which art and was and shall be, because thou hast judged thus. For they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and thou hast given them blood to drink, for they are worthy. And I heard another out of the altar say, Even so, Lord God, uh, just true and righteous are thy judgments. And the fourth angel poured out his vial upon the sun, and power was given unto him to scorch men with fire. And men were scorched with great heat, and blasphemed the name of God, which had power over these plagues, and they repented not to give him glory. And the fifth angel poured out his vial upon the seat of the beast, and his kingdom was full of darkness, and they gnawed their tongues for pain. And blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pain and their sores and repented not of their deeds. And the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great rivers Euphrates and the water thereof was dried up, that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are the spirits of devils working miracles which go forth into the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to battle of the great day of God Almighty. And he gathered them together in a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. And at that time thy people shall be delivered every one that shall be found written in the book. And I saw heaven open and behold a white horse and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. Yes, I truly believe that this battle of Armageddon is going to be very literal, spiritual as well as literal, but definitely literal, because Jesus is going to be coming from heaven and fighting. Well, those people that are left the, of the evil ones will die from the, his, the sword of his mouth. And in righteousness, he does judge and make war. And his eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his heads were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. 
And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Out of, out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh name, name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. What are the plans of the Vatican and all the earthly kings and their armies when they, through their Lucifer infrared telescope, yes. Yeshua and his heavenly army, the myriads of the angels, come in the clouds of heaven? Yes. And here we have the papacy lead, lead, leading the way, the army, to turn their weapons upon Christ. And then here's a quote from Douglas MacArthur. All who have not the spirit of truth will unite under the leadership of satanic agencies. That is from 7 BC, excuse me. Now I'm going to read the quote from Douglas R. Um, MacArthur. The nations of the world will have to unite for the next war will be an interplanetary war. The nations of Earth must someday make a common front against attack by people from other planets. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. And the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bondman and every freedman hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains and said unto the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? And the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air, and there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne, saying, It is done. And there were voices and thunders and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake, such as was not since men were upon the earth, so mighty an earthquake and so great. And the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nation fell. And great Babylon came into remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. And every island uh, fled away, and the mountains were not found. And there fell upon men a great hail out of heaven, every stone about the weight of a talent. And men blasphemed God because of the plagues of the hail, for the plague thereof was exceeding great. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. And these both were cast alive into a lake of fire, burning with brimstone. The false prophet and the beast, I just kind of wanted to clarify, the pro false prophet and the beast is not a person. It is a religious political system. This is Satan's Luciferian one world order that is going to be thrown into the lake of fire with brimstone and it will be gone forever. And the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceeded out of his mouth and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watch and keep his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. So this is the end of the seven trumpets. And uh, tomorrow I'm going to continue. Um, this is kind of my, what my thoughts were when I did this presentation, when I made this. Um, all of a sudden, you know, it came to my mind. Well, here, the trumpets have not happened yet, but they're very close to beginning, I'm sure. Um, so what is going to take place from here until they actually fall? And so that's what I want to start um, tomorrow on, which will be uh, 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 I can't remember the title of it. Uh, the cleansing of the sanctuary. OK, we're going to start with the cleansing of the sanctuary. Uh, and then we're going to go to the end. Thank you, Lynn. Well, thank you.
That was very eye opening. Well, it was for me too. When I put this together, I was I was amazed at um, when when you showed when you showed the telescope when it says one point eight m. Yes, that's probably meters. Oh, meters. That that's yeah. I think you're right. Yeah, because I think I read somewhere they're twenty seven feet across. So if that would add up to those meters. I read that somewhere, I think. Amazing. Well, there's a lot of things to study. We've learned a lot and heard a lot, and we need to do our research and absolutely keep going. Yes, you know, that uh, those uh, quotes of that telescope was done quite a few years ago, and they have much more powerful telescopes now. Yeah, so, I sent you an email about Lucifer because that was kind of not exactly what it was. <laughs> it wasn't a telescope, but um, there's an awful lot of stuff up there they're doing. I don't know. Yes. Yeah, Tom Horn and I think his name was Pittman. They went up there and they interviewed some of the Jesuits up there at that telescope. Yes. I remember but that. The telescope is not Lucifer. It's a part of it. Yes. And they changed it to Lucy because yeah. it was like, I don't know how many words, and they just decided to pick certain ones out and it spelled Lucifer. Hmm. They say that they, they were probably laughing at it. So it's all, there's a lot of stuff going on. I know the Jesuits are in it. I know there's a lot of stuff going on, but yeah. There's well, enough I scary things out there. I found a picture of Dr. Plata and his telescope. And I think you'll be impressed when you see it. Okay. In his backyard. <laughs> it's pretty impressive. Oh.